Uh, yeah, so hello and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today on our fourth Cluster Market Lab Talk series. My name is Marcel and I work for Cluster Market as an account executive. For those of you who don't know, Cluster Market is a lab equipment management software which helps and ena enable scientists uh, from different research areas to to work more efficiently in their lab. So therefore we work very closely with scientists and lab managers, engineers from different research areas and help them uh, by providing them a solution to speed up their research. The aim of our talk today is to engage with scientists and to produce meaningful content. So today we will be discussing AI, machine learning and automation in research with our three amazing panelists. Just to give you a structure, so uh, the first 45 minutes, we will just, I will ask a couple of questions where our amazing panelists will react and they will give us their point of view. And then we will have 50 minutes for the submitted questions. So you will see a Q&A section that to submit any question you have and one of our panelists will reply to the questions. I would like to give the opportunity now to our amazing panelists to introduce themselves so you know a little bit more what they do. Uh, so today with me, you have, uh, we are having Kimberly, Fane and Joanna who's joining us. Uh, Kimberly, maybe you can start. Sure, thank you. Happy to be here today. So my name is Kimberly and I'm originally from Germany. Um, I studied psychology. I specialized during my master on work organizational and personal psychology in Spain and Italy. And since last year, I started working for Iris AI. It's a Norwegian tech startup, um, which uh, offers AI-based tools for, for the search of uh, search finding and further analysis of scientific knowledge. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Ben, maybe you can go next. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Marcel and Cluster Market, for inviting us. I'm looking forward to the discussions. So um, I'm Fane Mensa. I'm uh, originally Dutch. Um, my background is in biological sciences, so biomedical degree. And then I moved to London to do a PhD in medicine at UCL. And uh, it was already three years ago when I finished. And I'm now working for Synthase, which is a R&D software platform that um, really focus on enabling scientists to use automation in a more efficient way um, without any need to code a script. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion as I mentioned, so. Thank you very much, Ben. Happy to have you here. And last but not the least, Joanna, maybe you can go next. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your invitation. My name is Joana Rocha. I'm a researcher at INESCTEC in Porto, Portugal. And I'm also a PhD student at the Faculty of Engineering in the University of Porto, where I also got my integrated master in bioengineering. So ever since my, my master, I have been, been working mostly on computer-aided diagnosis and also medical image analysis. And right now I'm focused on computer vision and explainable AI for thoracic pathology screening. Thank you very much. Again, thank you very much to all our panelists for participating. I'm sure you will have some great knowledge to share. So I'm looking very much forward. Uh, I think we should start as we have much to discuss today. Um, so one thing I was reading uh, and I have seen is that the evolution of AI has changed the entire 21st century. Um, in terms of technology, AI has stolen the spotlight. A lot of scientists are showing interest to the topic uh, of machine learning and turning to artificial intelligence for help with their research. I was wondering what your take is and what do you think are the most common uses of automation? And how are they boosting uh, discoveries in different research areas? Anyone can start. Yeah, I can I can go first. Um, for me, I think it's obvious that there are so many different applications for automation in science, which is one one of the uh, main benefits I would say. Mm -hmm. For me, my whole work uh, focuses on automating diagnosis based on medical images. 
So the science behind my work is the automation itself. So basically providing the physicians with a second opinion to make their job even more efficient. But if you take a look at all other applications, automation is a little all over the place. Um, and the great, great thing about it is that we can all benefit from it. Yeah. Maybe I can say a little bit more about what we're actually doing at Iris AI, and this tackles the problem of the huge amount of scientific literature that's out there and it's so difficult for a lot of researchers to, to find the most interesting, the most relevant literature and as well to read it because, I mean, publication numbers are just rising all the time. And so what we are trying to do is to kind of automate the search, automate the filtering, and as well, we help with uh, summarization. So we have tools that can automatically summarize um, the most relevant articles and as well help to, to extract the key data points. So I think this is also um, a main area where AI can help because it's just uh, that a lot of researchers spend so much time going through literature. And I mean, we have all the knowledge. So I think it's very helpful if we make it available and accessible for everyone very fast so that we can speed up um inventions or new discoveries yeah and um just just to add to that i think um in life science we're in a very very exciting period because um all these technologies are really allowing um young scientists but also scientists that come from different fields to really develop um and a nice thing about ai machine learning you see it in in other key areas not just life sciences already proving how how much value it can have mm -hmm. um, we're a bit reluctant in life sciences because it takes some time to get technology in. And as a scientist, um, getting new technology in, I think a lot of people will agree that it's not always an easy thing because there are a lot of things you need to think about. But I think what's really, really important is that um, it is there for the better course. And I think both um, other speakers mentioned it as well. It's, it's allowing us to do more efficient work. It allows us to, if you look at automation in two ways, it's one is the execution, but it's also automating processes. So, um, those, those two differentiations are also very, very key. And something that we also need to um, be aware of is it's not just throughput, it's not just doing as, as much as possible. Um, it's also about quality and, and doing really, really complex stuff. And, and um, that's why I think AI machining and automation um, are really, really important, really allowing scientists to do really complex stuff and, and groundbreaking work. Exactly, thank you very much. Uh, I think you already mentioned, Fane, uh, a few, and I think Joan and Kimberly as well, the benefits of using AI tools and how much it is helping in terms of in different areas. If we look at medicine, machine le learning is helping identify illnesses. Um, so it's, it's being used. A lot of people are seeing it as benefit, but I think you also touched it. There are limitations of automation. Uh, people will see it. They do think that there are some negative um, implications of AI. What is your uh, take on that? What do you think? Uh, do you think, do you first of all think there is any negative implication? And if yes, what do you think those are? Um, obviously, yes, I think the, the implications into that. I think the main important thing is, as I, as I said already, on other industries we're working on, but we are working on human lives. And I think that's, that's probably the most scary bit for scientists, but also people that are working in the space. Um, on the other hand, I think um, it's all about education. It's all about showing value. If I would go into a research organization and say, hey, you need to use automation or you need to use AI, and I can't really back up why it's improving the science or why they can do some groundbreaking work, um, you always hit that barrier. And because it's a bit scary, as I said, working with human samples, human lives, um, it's, it's, it's costly as well. So it's not something that you can just say, hey, I'd like to implement this new technology. Um, it, is, it comes really around trying to understand people's processes and trying to really fit in how it's improving their science. That's the most important thing. It's nice that we have all these great technologies. It's all about how is it improving your science as a scientist. And if you can level with that person on that end, um, it will be much easier in, in providing them with opportunities for several technologies. Um, so yeah, for me, it's all about communicating. It's all about trying to understand processes, doing research, and, and really providing value um, for the first and most. And then I think you'll be able to um, break that barrier of skepticism or, or scariness. 
Yeah, I agree with Fane. I think that um, the negative implications of AI um, are a very real problem. And we're seeing that this problem is being discussed in many institutions because um, of the um, high impact that these tools can have, especially if we're talking about uh, a healthcare application or very serious applications in, in the real world. And so we're seeing these institutions starting to discuss these negative and obviously positive impacts, including the Harvard Law School, which is very interesting. Um, and I think um, one of these negative impacts that we can't overlook is the possible bias and discrimination. So if you're, for example, aiming for speech recognition, but if you're training your algorithm with a very specific dialect, obviously it will not work for other languages and other dialects. And so I think that as researchers, we need to keep this in mind and question the data sets that we are using. And this, this has to be something uh, that researchers need to do from the, from the zero, from the start, uh, because we cannot, um, we cannot work with something that is flawed from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, the negative implications come with the sense of responsibility that, that needs to begin with the researchers and the scientists so that we are comfortable with the product or the research that we are developing. Yes, and in addition to, to the data sets that we train the machines on, I think it's also important to always keep in mind that and an artificial intelligence is not necessarily perfect, that it can still make mistakes. And I think sometimes, you know, it's such a buzzword to say AI, and I think it creates some expectation in people's mind, which are not true. So I think it's always important to always keep in mind and tell the researchers, you know, you should stay in control of, of what the machine is doing there. You should always have the control and the power to, to understand and to maybe look over the results that the machine delivers you and not just blindly trusting the machine that everything is perfect. And I think then a lot of negative consequences that could stem from the use of AI could be reduced just because we are more uh, mindful about what we're doing. Yeah, I think for me, AI um, is really about the data analysis process because uh, AI gives you the ability to speed up this process and make it more efficient obviously in opposition to having humans looking at and interpreting huge amounts of data. And we all know that data runs the world at the moment. And I think that AI has been a, a huge enabler for that in the sense that AI allowed us to make sense of all this data, mm -hmm. but it, we still need to take control of what is happening and what we're dealing with. So I think the pros and cons are very present in all the applications that we're developing. We just need we just need to balance them out. Yeah, and I just just to add on something that Kimberly said, which is really really important, is um, it's also the regulation and the ethics around not just your data set, but also the algorithms that you're working on. So um, yes, we are quite skeptical about it, but if you can prove the regulation, if you can prove through the ethics that what you're doing is valid and it has a significant purpose. Um, that make, that's that's really important as well. So I like that everybody touched upon it, that AI is not just AI, it's literally the data and your machine learning. So if the data doesn't really add up uh, or the data is not as good as it is, you always have problems with your AI as well. So it's, it's really important to separate that out and see as well, what are the ethics around it? What's the regulation? Because that will probably not be important in the beginning, but if you, as long as you go further and further and further, it will come back to you. And if you can then prove, hey, yes, my ethics and my regulations are correctly, it will make it much easier. That's very interesting uh, points which we have raised. I think uh, we also created a pool for people who are attending and just to ask them what do they think um, if, if they think that AI has a negative or positive impact on science. So I'm gonna just launch the pool and uh, see what people think um, just to have an idea so everyone you can just uh, vote if you think it has a positive impact or a negative impact um, and then I will share the results. Thank you very much uh, that's very useful to know. Um, I, I was reading as well and I heard that one of the arguments people were saying as something as a negative impact was 
that science requires creativity and uh, we haven't uh, created the program that can create uh, that. So it inhibits uh, also, some people say that it, it inhibits innovation and it doesn't allow you to uh, be more creative. You can't just change something in your protocol because once you do everything and on research, what, what's your impact and what's your message for those people who think that way? Cool. Um, I think that's, that's a really important point because if you look at scientific history, like penicillin was, yeah, just, I'm not saying fate, but penicillin was chance, by chance that we found it out. And look what a massive impact it had in, in, in life sciences and in human health. Um, to tackle that though, um, that was a long time ago. Uh, as I said earlier, it's, we're becoming more and more complex in what we're doing, where we, if you look into the drug development space, where we used to go into chemistry-based um, interventions, we now started moving into like biologics, biosimilars, and we're now using cell and gene therapy, which is literally biology that lives in our body that we're taking out and doing science on. So um, it's, it's very important for us to understand that for us to level up with the science or the innovation that you talked about, or the intervention in the case of um, drugs that we need to go into. It's, it's very important that we use technology that can keep up with that. And I think that's a really important thing to look into as well, because it will enhance innovation, um, but it's just about the, the high and the why and the how. So scientists should always be thinking about the how, how does compound X affect compound Y, um, and, and, and why is it really, really important? And if you bring in these technologies, they can really help you figure out the, the how. How do I set up this experiment? How does it basically need to base? How does an algorithm um, will affect a specific outcome? Um, so that why bit of a scientist is always important. You always need to be hypothesizing. You also need to think. But adapting these tools to really tackle the hows is, is really, really important. I would agree with Fane. And, uh, and I think it's not it's not an either or question. I mean, still we can have human creativity uh, and use AI. And I think we should especially use AI for those error prone processes that are most tedious, that takes up most of the time, like extracting data from, uh, from a PDF. I mean, this is nothing where we use our creativity as humans. It's just taking out some numbers and writing it down. So this can be super easily be automated by a machine. And then we would have even more uh, time and, and resources to be creative. So I think it's, it's uh, some, some people view AI as it's like replacing people, but I think it's just a help to free up more of our resources so that we can really Use, use the time and our resources for the things that is unique to humans, like creativity or empathy, things like that. It would be, I think as well for doctors, it would be great if they have, would have more time to spend actually with the patient and show empathy and show the personal side and not just doing all the, all the paperwork and all the research, which can, could be automated. Yeah, I completely agree with Kimberly because sometimes you have a certain research goal in mind and then along the way maybe these AI tools will help you find different patterns or different aspects of your work and then you get a different discovery or a different research line that, that you had or then the, the one that you had originally and so these tools can really help you to get a different perspective um, that you, would, you wouldn't have without them. So like, like Kimberly said, it's re I think this point is really important. They are not here to replace anybody. They are here to help and to improve what you're already doing. Yeah, and I think 95%, uh, so I'm just gonna end the poll and share the results because um, most of the people who also voted that it has a positive impact, we had one person who said negative. Uh, so I think a majority of the people do agree with that. My next question is um, what, I mean, I mentioned it in the beginning that it has been that AI and machine learning and has been like, especially the recent years, we have seen how much it has grown. Uh, what do you think, uh, what, what do you think it play, what kind of a role does it play in science uh, and how do you see it growing um, and what's your take on that? 
Anyway. Joanna, you're, you're perfectly uh, fitted to, to answer that question first. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, mostly because my PhD thesis would not be happening if these amazing tools and methods did not exist and were not available. So yeah, I'm the perfect person to say that AI is definitely growing. Um, it has amazing potential uh, if we know how to use it. Uh, so I, I guess that, um, like I said, there is a sense of responsibility that comes with automation. And I, I think, and it's my personal opinion, that people who use AI in their research should have a basic knowledge of how it works so that can, they can be more confident about the pros and cons of these tools. Mm -hmm. um, and I can give you an example. If you're aiming for a computer-aided diagnosis, um, I can bet that your system will still need human validation for now um, because most of the times, and in the majority of the times, your model will not be perfect. Uh, now, the question is, will that be the same situation in 100 years? Will we be able to achieve the perfect automated system? I don't know. Those are very interesting questions. But for now, AI does play a big part in science, but not a perfect one. So for me, validation is key. Um, it's a very interesting research uh, line and field, um, but we need to balance, like I said, the pros and cons to achieve the better results. Yeah, to, to add on to that, I think it's also nice to just turn it around. What if we didn't have AI or machine learning or any of these technology tools now? Um, I think no one wants to know what will, would have happened. Um, it would probably cost lives. Um, it would probably had impact in uh, the, the food that we consume, um, just the aspects of us living our lives. So I think it's also really important to turn it around and see, okay, what if we are without these tools? What impact could it have for, on, on a human life? And if you have that in mind, if you then say 10, 15, 20, 50 years forward, but we as human beings are developing, um, we all want to get older, we all want to work healthier, um, we all want to make sure that our children do the same thing. Um, and to do so, it's very important that we do see the value of these technologies if it really fits in the right purpose. That's, that's what I always um, like to add to that. I mean, I could just only add as well from a sales perspective that, you know, I'm working with the libraries, with universities, with R&D departments, and we just see an increasing interest in, in using AI as well for the discovery of research and scientific knowledge. So um, this is what we can see there that also universities are, are saying, um, you know, just students just going into a library and getting a book is not really uh, what's happening right now. So we, we need to incorporate smarter tools. Thank you very much. That's that's very helpful to know. I think, jo Joanna, you mentioned it, but I think it's very interesting because we have the majority of the people who are joining are from the academic side as well. So maybe uh, any tips you have or any feedback you have for people who wants to consider that as a study and they're just not sure about it. And what is your message for those people, for those academic people who wants to do this as a PhD or any study? Yeah, so I think um, if you're looking forward to know more about machine learning and deep learning, I think it, it is really important to understand the fundamentals and the mathematics behind machine learning and deep learning. Um, it will really help you to get a sense of what happens with these algorithms and how they work, how they produce these decisions. Um, because at the end of the day, these are probabilities. Uh, these are not... Um, super 100% reliable results. You will always have some risk involved. So if you're confident uh, with your algorithms, you know how they, how they work, uh, you, you are familiar with your data, you are confident about your data, that process will help you a lot during the development of your work and your PhD thesis, if that's what you're interested in. Um, so I think there's a preparation work that is much more important than the implementation itself. I think this, this process of data analysis is really the key. Um, and that's what I, what, what I can advise for now, because I think uh, it sounds easy, but it's not. 
Yeah, to, to add on that as well as um, uh, when I finished my PhD, I always had two things that I found really important career-wise. And because we are quite a lot of academics here as well, it's, it's really important to think about, um, I always wanted to have an impact. I always wanted to make sure like whatever I do um, outside of my academic career or within my academic career, I wanted to have an impact. Um, but another really important thing that you need to realize is perspective. So you should also think about, okay, where will I be in five to 10 years? And what are the skill sets that are, are really necessary? I was just recently speaking to someone who was, who was telling me that there are more PhDs doing computational PhDs than wet lab PhDs. That already tells you a little bit where the trend is going and where it will head into in the future. So my biggest advice for people that are working in this space, um, stick with it. Um, you're developing techniques and, um, and you're learning a lot that will benefit the industry that we're going to in the future. Whether that's in academic, academia, whether that's in biotech startups, whether it's in larger pharma, the skills that you develop around coding, scripting, um, building all these algorithms is, is so valuable that um, you always have a perspective and you also have an impact where you can basically uh, go into. Yeah. Um, another question which I have, I think we touched on that as well, is uh, what do you think are the most uh, exciting upcoming developments of AI uh, or what are you hoping that would be, uh, what is the one thing you think they should look into uh, which they haven't yet and it's a concern uh, for the science? Yeah, so as Fane said, we are expecting a lot of breakthroughs in the following years because so many people are trying different applications for AI and machine learning. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the aspects that I think is very interesting and it's already starting to happen is less legislation that is changing to address these uh, products, um, these AI-based products. And we're seeing how the laws are adapting to the, this new era of algorithms. And that is very interesting. And again, as Sven said, we will continue to see a lot of researchers pursuing this research line that is mainly focused on AI. So I think the development and improvement of AI methodologies will be one of the main goals for the recent future, I guess. Anyone wants to add something on that? Yes, I wanted to add, so from what we are working with, with uh, natural language processing, what I find very interesting, and this is something that we are working towards too, is as well the production of human text, human language. So that meaning that we, you know, right now what we can do is find literature, we can maybe paraphrase it, we can summarize it, but reaching that point where a machine could write a whole thesis saying, okay, the, the machine finds the literature, extract the key knowledge out of it, writes it. This is also a very interesting point where I'm not saying uh, humans should not write the thesis anymore, but that, you know, if you have really a research question that the machine can automatically go into the literature, finds the solutions in the literature, combines it and come up with something new that maybe humans did not see before or we did not synthesize it before. I think this is also very interesting that uh, this could happen in the future. Also, uh, another thing is um, earlier this year, Exciencia, which is a, a biotech company in, uh, in, uh, in Oxford, I think, they announced their first um, AI design immune oncology drug to go into clinical trials. Um, so the question around where is it going or, or what, what, what impact does it have? There you go, that's, that's already a, a, a really important one. Another really important thing is also um, going back to the data pieces because we all started thinking about AI machine learning. We also realized that the data that we're putting in wasn't really good. So what you really see a big trend in the biopharma industry now is that a lot of companies are really focusing on capturing the right data and processing it in the right way in which we can then lead, uh, have machine learning and do that bits on. So what I see a lot in my field is where can we capture data? How often do we capture it? How do we capture it? Um, so there's also a trend around data and, 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 and how, how we really think about data with AI and machine learning in, in our heads previously to a, an era where we just collecting data because, okay, at some point we'll probably do some research on it. 
So there's also a really big impact from AI and machine learning on the way we process and collect data. Um, and I think that's also really quite exciting. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if your model has 100% uh, accuracy, if your data is garbage, and then you won't be able to generalize and use that model in a real world application. So that is really the key for me, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, another thing uh, which I was reading as well is that uh, during the COVID, we have seen that uh, AI robotics, they played a huge role. Um, have you seen that as well? And what, what do you think is of what we can learn that during the pandemic uh, that AI could actually play a role? Uh, that was something new for a lot of people in the science field. Um, what's your take on that? I can tell you that there, there was an explosion of papers that address um, automated COVID detection based on medical images, for example. Um, the issue with many of these papers is that they were validated on a very limited amount of data while claiming to have these perfect evaluation metrics. But even so, I think that COVID appear, appeared as an opportunity for many researchers in my field to apply their work on this very specific situation for this very specific problem. So in a way, COVID has given a platform for many scientists, um, not only in medical image analysis, uh, but even in biotechnology when it comes to the development of all these vaccines. Um, I think the advances in AI and robotics certainly help to achieve uh, all these results and positive results. Yeah, and I, I, have to, I have to add to that as well is, um, I think that the COVID pandemic has showed what can happen if we all start working together and use the right tools. Um, there's always discussion around how is it possible that we were able to get such a vaccine within, was it not even two years uh, on the market? Um, and I think because we are now using these tools, because we had to, that's, that's a really important thing to think about because if I speak to decision makers or budget holders and they're saying, oh, yes, the, the lab of the future or the use of these technology is what we're thinking of and it will be implemented. No, it's now. It's starting now. So there's an urgency. And I think the COVID pandemic really showed that there's an urgency in life sciences and human health. Where we all need to come together, all work collaboratively together. And, and yes, that means using automation to have a higher throughput and be more efficient. That means using different algorithms to make sure that we can make quicker decisions. Uh, so these are all aspects that the COVID pandemic has really, um, really shown us as a life science industry, how we could work together really, really efficiently. Um, and, and I'm hoping to see that in um, other key areas as well. Um, a really good example is a lot of the cancer drug um, development has been put on hold because a lot of people focused on COVID. Now everything is coming back to normal. I would love to see a similar effect that we had on everyone coming together for COVID. The same thing happened for cancers or the same thing happens for antibiotic resistance diseases, cardiovascular diseases. There's so many areas in life sciences that can now benefit. And we've seen it, it is possible. So no one can argue that it's not possible. It's just that mindset that we talked about in the beginning that's now really trying to turn heads. And uh, especially younger scientists, especially the ones that are capable of making all these great algorithms and, and scripts. Those are the ones that are really going to push this forward. What do you think? I, sorry. I also, sorry, Kimberly, let me just add a quick, a quick um, aspect to what Fane said. I think people forget that research needs funding and funding was very, very available uh, during the COVID pandemic to solve these issues. So perhaps people need to start thinking about science differently and not only when there's a pandemic going on because all these discoveries were possible because people were committed and because people had the funding that was necessary for science to happen. So there's so much more to consider from, from this pandemic when it comes to research. Yeah, I agree. And as well to add on to that, I mean, funding is a big issue and the expenses for research could decrease if we use AI just because we would not need so, so many humans working there. We wouldn't need to pay them. So, I mean, this is another way to, yeah, to foster the development of drugs on, on, uh, for, 
for sicknesses which don't get a lot of attention. And uh, so I totally agree with uh, what Joanna and Fane just said. I just wanted to mention one thing, one development that I did not like uh, that stemmed from uh, COVID on AI, uh, because I had the feeling that a lot of the use of AI was then focused on how can we prevent that humans come together. So instead of, I don't know, like, you know, you going to a doctor, you have an app or you, uh, you do uh, you know, what Joanna just said, or that you have like uh, robots in, uh, in the bank instead of a human being, because we wanted to prevent that people get in touch to, to stop the spreading of, of um, Corona. Um, and I mean, I'm a psychologist. So in general, I think humans need to be in touch with other humans. So I think, uh, I mean, of course, we are trying to protect each other and we're trying to protect each other's health. But once we got a control of that, I think we should reduce that a little bit and try that, you know, humans should get in touch with each other again. And if it's at the supermarket, uh, the bank or wherever, um, and I don't think we should replace any, everything with uh, robots. And as well, going to the doctor is something I would trust a doctor maybe more. And maybe it's just going there, talking to a person and instead of just being on your phone and writing down your symptoms. Yeah, I, I have to say I agree with you because I think what you lack in, in the examples that you um, gave is emotion. Yep. You lack also the effect another person will have on you saying something or making a decision. Um, so yeah, I 100% agree with Kimberly. We need to keep that human component on board as well um, in our day-to-day -day lives and also in some cases within science. Yeah. Yeah, I think Fane, you mentioned as well that uh, what we have seen or what, what we have learned during COVID that people are coming together, they're working much more efficiently. What do you think, why, what, why is that, why did that only happen when we had a pandemic? Why was people not doing that before? Uh, what is the problem uh, or what do they see as a problem um, coming together and uh, solving issues we have in the world? I think it's a good question. I think uh, a couple of things. One is money uh, mentioned. I think also constraints. Um, and also, don't forget, a lot of people have different agendas, right? Um, I might be collaborating with someone and um, <clears throat> yes, we're using a similar technique where we both get better on, but I'm doing it for, let's, say, let's just take my, uh, my immunology background in. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do it for B cells and the other person does it for T cells. Right, there's different interest in applying a very specific technology towards the process. Um, so, so I, I do think it's 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 the common goal. Um, on the other hand, this is something that you can still create. Right, you can still have an object objective to say, you know what? Although you work on B cells, I work on T cells. We can have a common goal, which is getting this technology to work in various diseases. Right. So, I think. Having that, and this is why exactly what happened with COVID, right? Because a lot of people came together because we had one common goal. We might have different objectives. We might come in from different angles, different expertise, different backgrounds, but we made sure that we work together because there's one solid common goal that we had to go into. Mm -hmm. um, so on your, on your point around what made this really accelerate things, um, it is really around uh, the fact that um, we allow people to come together and we were seeking for them as well, right? Because normally when you're working with someone or you bump into someone, it's, it's not always an active process. Now it was an active process to get an expert from that angle, that angle and that angle and all come together. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's probably one of the reasons, common goal and, and getting the right people in the right rooms. I would also say that in this case, it was as well, fear because I think uh, because right now I mean there are a lot of sicknesses in the world and everyone has a little bit more fear about this one or that one um, but when corona started I think everyone was just afraid because it was new because no one understood what's happening so everyone was like okay we need to really tackle this first this is priority number one so there was this sense of it's urgent it's kind of close to me because everyone felt like I can get it and humans are really good in neglecting probabilities. Um, so, you know, humans don't understand that they can as well get any other kind of sickness. 
um, because they're just thinking about today and not thinking about um, negative future um, happening. Um, so I think, yeah, because we are very selfish most of our time, so I don't, as long as there's not the sense of urgent, it will affect me, it will affect my family, then we are not super willing to all work together and collaborate, which is sad. But uh, of course, funding is, there's not a lot of funding and there are a lot of problems to tackle in the world. So I guess it's as well difficult for each of us to prioritize what is now the, the main goal? What do we have to tackle first in order to make the world better? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, I think we mentioned it in the beginning as well, uh, but that maybe just to point out again, uh, as there are some concerns from people who um, still don't trust it using AI tools, automated uh, machines in the labs. And I think Joanna, you also mentioned that uh, it's not, robotics are not here to replace our jobs. Uh, but for people who actually do think like that, what what's your message and what do you, want to say to them? Uh, I think the the main part of the question really has to be the fact that we're working to make their job better, not to replace them. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I think that perspective comes from a lot of misinformation in the sense that um, if you know the basics behind um, AI and machine learning, you will know that where we stand right now, it is not possible to simply automate all the processes and applications and never look at it again until we get the result. It doesn't happen like that. So if you understand how the mathematics work uh, works behind these algorithms, you will um, be much more comfortable using these models and understanding these models. Um, and you will let go of that um, feeling that you have that uh, robots will come for your job and you will be replaced. And that is really not the case at all. Um, and I think that um, misinformation is also, um, uh, how can I say it? I think that we're seeing a different AI arising in the last few years that has um, been translated through explainable AI because in real world applications, simply providing a certain outcome is not enough to promote their usability. And so you will need a lot more uh, than, uh, than a simple output to support that decision and explainable AI can do that for you. Uh, it can uh, provide a justification for that outcome so that the end user is much more comfortable using that model um, in opposition to simply relying on relying on that decision without getting um, any more information. So the, there's a shift in the way that AI is being implemented at the moment through explainable AI, precisely to help the end users to feel more comfortable with, with these models and with these algorithms. Yeah, on, um, on that as well as if I, if, if we take like the, the most use handling in, in like, um, biology or biological sciences or even chemical sciences is handling of liquids. And obviously I'm, I'm now in the field where we have automation for liquid handling. Uh, but what a lot of people need to realize is that that's the, one of the most important features of a scientist in a lab is be able to have a liquid A and do something with it to get a certain result. And what we need to be aware of as well is, is that um, when you go into training, you basically been trained to be a good liquid handler um, for the one and only reason is because that allows you to get good data that allows you to publish stuff that allows you to enable collaborations that allows you to go into a conference and talk about your data but what we also need to be aware of is that that is not the thing that defines you as a scientist it's the really hypothesis thinking it's you designing an experiment you making sure that you're comfortable in what you'd like to do as an as a scientist so we also need to make sure that we separate that out, the, the, the manual activity versus the open thinking, the hypothesis driven. Um, and as I said in the beginning, the why versus the how. Um, and then this is where robotics and automation come in because they will execute what you have in your mind. 
without problems about reproducibility, without problems about high throughput, without problems about um, making silly mistakes. Uh, so I think that's something that we need to be aware of as well as a scientist, like what are the tools that can help us quicker and further and automation and robotics, in this case, in liquid handling, um, is very important. Thank you very much. I think that's very good uh, to close and end this event. Any final words from your side? Any messages? I think you already mentioned uh, some amazing insights. But if if I haven't given you the opportunity, if you would like to say something, uh, you are free to do so as well. Nope. <laughs> okay, thank you very much uh, to three of you for the inc incredible insights into the conversation. It has been extremely interesting to learn about AI machine learning. I personally learned a lot. Um, and of course, thank you for everyone who joined and for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed our lab talk uh, today. And as mentioned, if you have any questions which we haven't covered and uh, you want to reach out, please do so. You can reach out to Cluster Market or to one of our panelists, and I'm sure they are happy to answer it as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marcel. Thank you, Thank you, Kimberly, Joanna.